Welcome back, everybody. So in your programs, this panel is called Powering Up the Energy Transition. I'm going to try and sex that up a little for you. You know the old journalist motto, first simplify, then exaggerate. Well, let me do that. This is the best practice panel now, and I'm going to do a little bit of speed dating with two power companies um, to give their view of what best practice in this sector is and what the utility of the future will look like in a decarbonized uh, world. So I'm going to talk to Enel and Acciona Energy. I'm going to start with Francesco Starrace, who's the CEO of um, Enel, and will later come to Rafael Matteo and bring them both together in the end for a few joint questions. Francesco, welcome, Hi. first of all. Thank you. Greenpeace calls Enel the first truly green energy giant. Have you put that on your business card yet? No, I just put it on a tie. <laughs> 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 Very good. Very good. <laughs> no, I uh, You have managed to turn around an old style, old school European utility and basically led from behind. This is a transition that is taking a lot longer in other utilities. How did you promote this very profound cultural change? How did you do it? Well, first of all, to be honest, it was not such an old structure than an old, the, you know, there were a lot of advanced practices in Enel that perhaps were not fully known. <coughs> we were the only digital uh, distribution network uh, in the world and still are one of those uh, that are leading in this. But that said, I think what we basically did was um, something that is a little bit painful, that is understand what we did wrong. Mm. where we always made the same mistake and say, we will never learn, so let's not try again. Even if we try harder and harder, you know, in Italy we have this say, don't case, don't fly, even if they try hard. Mm. So we said, <coughs> frankly, we should stop doing what this industry has been doing for so long, that is invest in large infrastructures that take more than three years to be built, and that have merchant exposure. And if you'd say, I don't do this anymore, all of a sudden you take away from your investment strategy large hydro, coal plants, nuclear plants, uh, anything that takes more than three years. Maybe some gas, c gas combined cycles that might have problems there. And then the question is, then how can we grow if we don't do this anymore? And we said, yeah, there's a lot of other things that we can do to grow. And we had to build a capacity, a capability, a know-how to manage many more smaller pr projects, not on a merchant basis, which were mostly renewables, uh, which is easily said and not easily done because it requires a lot of pain from the management standpoint. You know, you need to retain, motivate, train, and manage a lot, a, a more, a, a bigger number of smaller and of uh, smarter people, which is typically difficult from management standpoint. So that that was uh, the difficult part. Mm. Once we did that, we also said it's wrong. Another, com you know common wisdom of the industry that you should concentrate on a few markets and become good at those. We said this is totally wrong because it I inev inevitably it stalls your growth or compromises the quality of the growth. So we said we will continue to enlarge and diversify our geographical footprint. And again, this is painful from the management standpoint because it adds complexity and adds a challenge to people. But if you do that, then you build optionality, you hedge your uh, regulatory and country risk, and you have a lot more freedom. Where was the biggest pushback? Was it the skepticism? Was it management or was it shareholders? What would you say? No, shareholders, they, they loved it because they said, you know, stop doing these mistakes over and over. No, the shareholders said, great. The management, frankly speaking, there was no pushback. I mean, most of the people agreed to this. It's just that we had to conceptually redefine the organization and make these simple things that are, like I said, they're not difficult to say, but then to do them, it's a completely different story. So the, the discipline that you have to put in the organization in order for these simple things to really become facts, mm. 
there's a lot of, uh, of effort in that. Yeah. So what's your one piece of advice, you know, the one minute headline for the people who are trying to create this kind of momentum? Look, d take this painful view uh, at yourself in the mirror and say, well, I'm, I'm not so nice looking <laughs> and say, <laughs> where is it <laughs> that you're always trying and trying and take that, t give up hope that you can fix these mistakes because it's years, decades. So take them away, forget them, and focus on what you really want to do. And that's uh, not so simple. Uh, One of the things this has entailed for NL is to refocus from governments to consumers. I mean, utilities mm. traditionally have been very focused on governments. Yeah. What has that transition actually meant for the company? It, 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 uh, I can say this in, in a few words. Many utilities say we have so many megawatts and so many million customers. The only thing is that they don't really know what they're talking about when they talk about customers. They, they, they confuse meters with customers. So if you have a meter, it doesn't necessarily mean that you, behind this meter there is a customer of yours. You don't know anything about that. You, you only give them energy and then uh, measure and build them. That's it. So we're saying customers, they have to be willing to engage with you with a contract and choose you freely. So we have, for example, 61 million users connected to our networks and something between 16 or 17 million free customers, mm. which is a big number. Those are the customers and the others are simply s provided energy and because the, the regulatory framework sometimes doesn't even allow that. So then we have to see what these guys want and what is basically they want is not energy. Which is another mistake. They don't want energy because they, they know this is their right to have. This is not something <laughs> that is even discussed. Energy is a right we have when we are born, basically, in if we're lucky to be born in certain parts of the world. So they give it for granted. What they want is a good service. What they want a uh, flawless service for that. And that's much more difficult. Mm, that's a little speaking. bit. Sounds a little that's bit really the effort we're doing mm. to become ex the best in class in providing the service to the customers, mm. not necessarily just the providing energy. That's and can you keep providing that service and move to 100% renewables, what, over the next 50 years? What we said is that we will be fully decarbonized by 2050. So that's less than 50 years. So yeah, uh, absolutely. So, you <coughs> <coughs> so that will be yeah. carbon neutral. Yeah. yeah. Well I th carbon neutral is a little bit a uh, tricky word. Yeah. Yeah? Uh, we said decarbonize. With carbon neutral, it's, you know, there's a lot of compensation around that. No, we're just saying we're not going to burn fuel to produce electricity by 2050. On that amazing note, I think yeah. we will now move to our second speaker, but you will come back in a minute. Sure. Um, can I just ask you to wait yeah. there so that we have a speed dating sort of scenario? <laughs> now, Rafael, thank you. Thank you. Rafael Mateo, uh, the CEO of Acciona Ener Energia, so from a uh, Spanish company. You started out actually as a managing um, director of a coal plant, and I just learned in our conversation before that the smokestack of your plant was taller than the Eiffel Tower. Yes, it was. Those were the <laughs> days in the 1980s. Yeah, here you are running. Many, many years ago. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and now you're running the biggest 100% renewable utility in the world. Yes. That's a big shift. Now, you never had the problem of phasing out assets, fossil fuel assets, like uh, Francesco does, you bet on renewables from the start. What were the sort of, would you say now with hindsight, advantages and challenges of being such an early mover? Okay, yes, uh, to, to be a pioneer is, is a very interesting thing, but uh, being a pioneer, you are in front of all the problems, you are in front of all the advantages. As a first comer in the markets, uh, you can suffer a lot the, the main mistakes from the regulators, from the technology, but at the same time, you are acquiring a very long experience. So one of the advantages we have today is that we are ha we, we having a more than 20 years of experience in wind. Our first wind farm is today uh, 20 years uh, old. Our first PD facility is more than 15 years old. So we have uh, accumulating a very long experience with a very good teams operating uh, renewable assets in 20 countries, 
uh, in a very close relation with the regulators, helping them to improve the regulation. So uh, we have been uh, living as a direct wit witness the, the, the energy regulation from inside. So uh, today we are in front of the new uh, era for the energy. We are going to use the natural energy resources against to consume the natural energy resources. And so the, the long-term experience uh, is helping us to, to be the, the higher quality actors in the markets, to, to go to the tenders, even to win the tenders without sacrificing the return. We are not able of sacrificing the returns for winning a tender because this is a family-owned company and the, the family-owned company needs to think in the long term. So all our activities are thinking in the long terms in the sustainability of our activity in economical terms. Has there ever been a wobble of the fact that you were not diversifying into fossil fuel energy sources? I mean, I know you're technology agnostic when it comes to renewables, but has there ever been a wobble as to whether to diversify into gas or anything like that? No, the, the idea from the company from the beginning was just clean energy as a very clear contribution to the to the climate change. And today we are operating 9,000 megawatts in 20 countries, but just uh, clean energy. So we are not emitting any uh, CO2 uh, in, in our assets. So we are carbon neutral in terms of, of emission because we are operating hydro, biomass, uh, CSP, PV, or, 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 or wind mostly. Uh, so uh, the, the it's a very clear idea that no fossil assets in, in our portfolio fully convinced that about in the future 100% of the energy in the world will be renewable so we are in the in the line your home market is spain uh, which um, is one of the frontier countries in the renewable space or at least was um, until regulatory support schemes were abruptly scrapped and renewables basically went from 70 miles an hour to zero you are one of the few if maybe the only survivor it was tough what is your message today to regulators and governments in spain and elsewhere uh, in terms of incentivizing, setting the right incentives for this sector to grow? Yes, Spain is, is now something around half of our markets where we are operating assets abroad and investing uh, abroad for, uh, for the next uh, for the next years. It depends on the regulator. There are many kinds of regulator. Probably each market needs a different kind of regulator. A common, a common message to them is that energy is a very long-term business, it's a very intensive in equity business, so we need a stable regulation. But it's not the same regulation that we need in the emerging markets with the necessity of more capacity than uh, in a very uh, mature economies as Europe, where, where the necessity is no more capacity, the necessity is the substitution of very old and fossil uh, plants for the new energy. So the, the, the message to them is they need to know before regulation what is the, 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 the that they are pretending. In, in some opportunities, in some markets, uh, it's very difficult to, uh, to understand if the regulator is, is just uh, preferring to have a quick announcement about a reduction of the prices in the future, mm -hmm. or is really thinking about the necessity of uh, having a, a long-term clean energy supply in the future. That is not exactly the same. A very low price is very easy. It's, it's, it's a question of putting in the B envelope. Uh, you can put the, the lower price in the, in the market. But uh, this is uh, one thing, and another thing is to be able of getting a project, financing a project, building a project, and operating a project for 20, 30, for, or 40, or 50 years. So the regulator needs to, needs to forget the energy as a way of making politics. And, and, and in terms of the politics, I mean, what can regulators do? I mean, if, if I mean, there's you can't, you're not going to put a floor on any prices. There's not really, the prices keep coming down. I mean, is there a floor in your mind as to what is feasible today? I mean, what sort of projects would you say aren't credible anymore? What sort of prices are, are you talking about? Well, that's, that's, a, that's a real situation is that technology is helping a lot because the cost, uh, the price of the technology and the cost of the technology is, is being lower and lower and is more efficient. So in terms of cost of the energy, the technology is helping the, the low cost of the energy. Same the cost of the money. The, there are a lot of uh, money that is uh, going to the renewables because it's a very low risk financial product. It's, it's delivering a very stable yield, but, uh, but there is a limit for the prices. So the, the limit is 
uh, when the project is not becoming a real a reality, when the project is delayed because the, the, the it's difficult to finance, it's difficult to, to build, so this is the limit. So probably uh, we will see the limit. So th this is not a, this is not the Olympic Games where each tender needs to have a new record. It's good to, to reduce the price, it's the obligation of the regulator, but in a tender where uh, hundreds of uh, companies are competing in the same tender, not all of them are offering the same. Mm. There are many companies that are utilities, uh, other companies that are developers or manufacturers, or, or and, and probably some of them, when they are presenting a very low price, they are not thinking in becoming a long-term operator. They are thinking in selling the project with the PPA the day after. So we need to, uh, to organize better this kind of process. Right. I'd love to bring Francesco back on stage now. We have nine minutes left. I'm going to ask a couple of questions, but then I'm going to open it up. So um, you should all be thinking about your questions too. Um, I mean, one thing that has been on my mind, because I, I learned that both of you um, are uh, active, your companies are active in the United States. In particular, uh, Enel has become a, a leader on green energy there. Uh, I mean, are you worried about next Tuesday at all? Maybe not because we are investing in the USA and renewables. There is a bigger right. worry than that. <laughs> I think, um, you know, we have a presence in more than 25 or 20, I forgot, the s states in the USA. And almost all of these states are Republican states. Mm. Most of the Midwest and most of the South. Uh, and these governors and the administration of these states love our business, they welcome the investment, they see no contradiction, they see no fight, and they see just jobs creation and value for them. It's a very pragmatic, uh, typical American view of things. So I think after this uh, horrendous campaign is over, whoever wins will have to cope with the fact that there is a flow of investment into the USA, that renewable industry is a big industry in that country. It is the only prob probably growing industry so far, apart from, uh, from what has happened in the past on, on gas fracking. So I think it's a very, I, I'm not so concerned, frankly speaking. I'm concerned by other stuff. Right. It has nothing to do with energy. Would you agree that uh, Trump victory wouldn't actually have an impact on say, the Paris Agreement or any kind of commitments in that direction and companies like yourself? No, the have been the same. Uh, we are also operating in the, in the U.S. and, and uh, even we are today investing in the U.S., but uh, we are not... Uh, uh, we are preparing the next uh, PTC extension plan in the, in the, in the market, but uh, uh, happily we have in front of us, we have a very wide scope of geographies to invest. So if the conditions, if the regulation is is in, in favor of more investment in renewables, we will be there. But there are many markets in, in, in Africa, in, in Asia, or in Latin America, there is room enough to invest. Uh, we are in a small company compared with, with our actors in the market, and we need to be very focused in the market, so it's in the, the best opportunities in terms of returns. So let me ask you now, having listened to each other a minute ago, um, is there a lesson that Enel can learn from Acciona, who's a leader in the renewables field, something that you're trying to ramp up, in fact, build towards by mid-century? Well, I think Acciona has been a successful uh, evolution from an originally quite complex group, because uh, there was uh, a lot of other stuff, into a more focused uh, renewable energy player, and also a quite a unique combination between a manufacturing part of the business and a developer and investing part of the business. You know, we are not in manufacturing, we will never be. I think it's, I have a lot of respect in those that can cope with both worlds. But I think what, what, what we, we can all learn from Axiona is that provided you have the long-term view and the focus, you can combine businesses that have perhaps a different life uh, cycle. It's, it's a success story in that. But you need the long-term view. And for your part, having listened to Francesco, do you think that, uh, that NL is a credible, a credible plan to actually become carbon neutral by 2050? Or no, decarbonized was the word. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt about uh, uh, in 2050, all the energy will be renewable. In, uh, no doubt about NL will get. The Stanford University said a couple of days ago that 
uh, renewable uh, will be the energy in the world in, in 2015. Uh, uh, some of the small countries as Costa Rica uh, are uh, living today more than 200 days, 100% renewables, all kind of renewables, geothermal. So, so it's possible and, and it's possible uh, for, for, for companies as, as Enel with a very clear vision of the future. I was part of the Enel group in the past. <laughs> I was working in, in <laughs> Endesa, Enel subsidiary for many, for, for <coughs> almost 30 years. In, in, and, and so we are colleagues and friends and competitors, uh, but we are setting the, the long-term vision of the, of the energy. The energy in the future will be just renewable. I will now open it up to the floor. Um, we've got about four and a half minutes left, so any questions? There's one on the aisle there. Can I have a microphone, please? <coughs> Thank you, gentlemen. My name is Martin Hallen from the Renewable Energy Policy Network. We've been publishing the Global Status Report on Renewables for the last decade. My question is to you, Mr. Starace. Um, we just came back from Moscow, where, of course, the topic of renewables is not, uh, you know, the most uh, en vogue, let's mm -hmm. say. Um, and we've championed a regional investigation of the status. And 300 million inhabitants, but only 0.5% investment globally as of last year. So mm -hmm. nothing's really happening there. My question to you, given that Anel is really active throughout the globe, what is holding you back, especially in a region like Central Asia and also the Eastern European countries, to really jump into this pool of opportunity given the potential that is there compared to all the other regions that have been mentioned throughout this morning, actually? Thank you. In order for us to choose a country where to invest, <coughs> we look at three things. One, there must be at least more than one uh, abundant natural resource so not only wind, not only solar, not only hydro, a combination of at least two. And Russia has more than that. Two, you need to have a healthy balance between supply and demand. In, in this case, Russia today is long generation by a large extent. So why throw additional generation? And that's not fully met. The third is you need to have a regulatory and legal system that you can understand and trust. We have about 10,000 megawatts of thermal generation in Russia, so we know the system. It is a special system, but it works very well. So we can trust the system to work. The what is holding us back is that, put it very bluntly, today Russia needs no generation, and it will probably not need generation for more than five years, provided that demands pick up again. So <coughs> unless the Russian government has a strong policy to shut down thermal generation and invest in renewables, which today we have not yet seen, that's what is lacking. Next question. There's one in the back there. Dominic Peitinger from the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. You talk quickly about uh, financing investments. I mean, there's, there's billions being shifted into the renewable energy space, um, but both of you were not going uh, to the capital markets and, and issuing green bonds or creating equity models such as YECOs, in promising models, but also with challenges. So question is, you financed th this from your um, operating cash flow, <coughs> this transition, and if so, would you consider going to the capital markets and also structure something around green bonds or yield costs, is it to further um, mm -hmm. scale up these investments? You want to start this? Okay, so in, in, in terms of financing, I think the finances is not the, the bottleneck today in the, in the renewal. So the, the it's more difficult to find a very good project than to find the enough money to finance the project. So in, in our particular case, we are today a company with around one billion of uh, dollars of uh, EBTDA, so uh, the, the cash flow is enough to finance the, the, the growth in the future, but uh, for us it's not difficult to, to found money to be invested in our projects. Uh, the real difficult thing is to found a good project in a good location with clear permitting, with uh, enough uh, uh, wind hours or load factor or solar radiation, and bankable, but if you have the, the, project, the bankable project, money will come, no doubt. Maybe I can <coughs> add one thing, that the way in which renewables is now developing, which is a very competitive tender or semi-tender auction system, most of the areas of the world, 
<coughs> prevents project financing to be used upfront, because this would give you a competitive handicap that would be very difficult to beat. So we always win projects based on our cost of capital and balance sheet right from the beginning. And typically, we fund the construction of the project like that. Then we refinance later when the risk of construction is gone down through different structures. Wha have we not used green bonds so far? It's not because we don't like green bonds, but simply we didn't find a convenience. Maybe we will find a convenient green bond and then we'll do that. And, and, and you don't hear that much of it because it's always happening like a year or two after the winning of the project. So it's kind of in the back, but we always refinance later. Thank you both. I wish we had more time. Um, it was a short speed date here on stage, Great. but um, we're going to make way now for the next panel. Keith, Brett, Ratcher and Total, breaking the mold. Hello. Hello. Uh, 